series called Courageous Faith as we're looking at some profiles in courage of biblical characters who truly embody what it means to live a courageous faith. And today we are going to be looking at the Old Testament story and book of Esther. And Esther's Hebrew name, her Jewish name, was Hadassah. And Hadassah was a beautiful young Jewish woman who grew up as a stranger in a strange land. She was not an immigrant, a refugee, nor an asylum seeker. Her family had been forced to leave their home in Jerusalem and was taken into exile in Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. And those Jews who ended up in Babylon were treated more like hostages and prisoners. They had absolutely no social or political power. They were the other and the outsider. They were also seen as being expendable. In 539 BCE, that was quite a while ago, Cyrus of Persia conquered the Babylonian Empire and made it his own. And this improved the life of the Jews living in exile there considerably as they were finally allowed to worship and practice their faith freely. Their social and political status, however, remained unchanged. They were still seen as nobodies. And Esther's story should not be romanticized or turned into some kind of ancient fairy tale, for it was far from that. Esther came of age in the time of King Xerxes of Persia, who ruled from around 486 to 465 BCE. She was an orphan who had been raised by her cousin Mordecai. And her greatest asset, and some would argue her greatest curse, was her physical beauty. At a young age, Esther was singled out and groomed to be a prostitute in King Xerxes' harem. She was the victim of human traffic and had no power to stop this from happening. If she had protested or refused the king's invitation, she would have been killed immediately. She had no choice but to transform herself into exactly what the king desired. An object of unrivaled beauty that could be used for his own lustful desires or to show off like a prize to other men to make them envious and jealous. It's not sounding like a fairy tale, is it? Esther did just that. She transformed herself into the king's ideal woman and was selected from his harem of hundreds and possibly thousands of young women to become the next queen of Persia. And she gained this title only because the previous queen, Queen Vashti, had angered the king when she refused to answer his summons when the king wanted to show her off to his friends and royals, royal officials at a royal party. Vashti's punishment for speaking up and saying no to the king was banishment, which basically meant she lost everything, food, clothing, shelter, and most importantly, she lost the king's protection. It was basically like a death sentence. Vashti's actions also had a negative impact on every woman living in Persia at the time. For after her banishment, King Xerxes sent out an edict saying that every man was the master of his own home and that basically no woman had the right to say no to her husband about anything. 
And what limited voice and power Persian women had at that time was completely erased by this edict. And it was into this context that Esther became the new queen. King Xerxes loved Esther's beauty and her charm, but because she was a woman, Esther believed that even as the queen, she believed she had no real power or voice. As a Jew, Esther's cousin Mordecai did not hold much social or political power in Persia either. Mordecai spent much of his time outside of the king's gate, and to the royal officials in the king's court, he was just another beggar with his hand out. But Esther, being raised by Mordecai, had great respect for him because he was like a father to her. And when she was chosen to be the queen, Mordecai advised her not to reveal that she was a Jew. No one knew her secret except for Mordecai. And one day while Mordecai was outside the king's gate, he overheard two of the king's security guards plotting to kill the king. Now he could have stayed silent. He didn't have anything to gain by telling anyone, but he did. He informed Esther of the plot, and Esther told the king, giving credit to Mordecai. And when the situation was investigated and the charges found to be true, the two guards were sentenced to death, and Mordecai was honored for coming forward with the information that saved the king's life. But you can imagine that after that attempt on the king's life, he started to kind of circle the wagons and make sure that everybody within his inner circle was absolutely loyal and could be trusted. He only wanted people serving in his court that were completely loyal to him. And he found that person in Haman. Haman was a man of great social and political ambition, who saved the king without question, who served the king without question, and was duly rewarded for his loyalty and obedience. Haman became the most high-ranking official in the king's court and had almost unlimited power and authority to do anything he wanted to everyone except the king. And as the saying goes, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And it was no different with Haman. His ego and vanity led him to believe that everyone should bow down and kneel before him just as if he were the king. And almost everyone played along with Haman's self-obsessed power trips. But Mordecai did not. Mordecai refused to kneel before Haman. Mordecai refused to recognize Haman's authority and would not bow down to him in public or in private. And this infuriated Haman. But instead of reserving his anger just for Mordecai, he projected it upon the entire Jewish population. Thousands upon thousands of Jews living in exile in Persia. And Haman began using fear and lies and misinformation. He began to fuel hatred against the Jews. He labeled them as strange and other and criminal. He even went to the king and claimed that it was the Jews that were causing all the problems in the kingdom, inciting rebellion because they would not submit to the king's authority. Haman then used that fear he had stirred up amongst the people and devised a horrific plan to have every Jew in the Persian Empire killed by the order of the king. 
all because his ego was bruised. He felt disrespected. One man now giving a death sentence to thousands of people. Sadly, this demented and evil plan would have succeeded except for one thing. Haman did not know that Esther was a Jew. And when Mordecai learns of Haman's plot to kill all the Jews in Persia, he risks his own life and Esther's to inform her of what is happening and to beg her to intercede for her people before the king. Esther is then faced with a seemingly impossible decision to either remain silent and hope that everything will turn out all right or to speak up and risks being silenced forever by the king. For in Esther's time, if a woman spoke to a man in public without first being invited to do so, it was viewed as a capital offense, punishable by banishment or even death. And in pondering this decision, Mordecai reminds Esther that perhaps... Perhaps that God had led her to be queen for just such a time as this. And so she has to be faced with that nearly impossible decision to speak up or to remain silent. And Esther's faith in God her trust in God, that no matter what God was with her, no matter what God would lead her through, she decided to risk everything and to speak out and to break the silence. So she devised a plan, one where she didn't outright go and step before the king, but she was smart. She invited both the king and Haman to a special dinner and then invited to them to another dinner the next night where finally, as an act of hospitality, the king asked her, what can I do for you? Even half my kingdom, he says, would not be too much to ask. Now, there's temptation in there, right? I mean, Esther could have at that moment asked for anything. She could have been that $1.5 billion lottery winner right there, right then. But she knew what she had to do. She knew how important this moment was. And instead of asking for something for herself, she risked her life to call out Haman and his evil acts. And she told the king exactly what Haman had planned for the Jews, and especially even for Mordecai, the one who had saved the king by calling out that insidious plot. And thankfully, her speaking up and breaking the silence changed the mind of the king, and the king had Haman arrested and punished and yes, ultimately put to death for his actions against the Jews. So for Esther and Mordecai and the thousands of Jews living in exile in Persia at that time, there was a happy ending to this story. But sadly, today, there are too many Hamans in our world fueling fear and hatred with lies and misinformation about marginalized and vulnerable groups of people who have little or no voice in our society. People like immigrants and refugees, Jews and Muslims, 
LGBTQ persons and their families. Friends, these Hamans are not just bullies. We need to call them what they are. They're terrorists. They're terrorizing people for what they believe and for who they are. And the American author and poet and civil rights activist Audre Lorde once said, there are still too many silences that need to be broken. And if we as the church do not stand up together and speak the truth in love to break those silences, they will sadly be broken in tragic ways like we witnessed in Pittsburgh yesterday. For just over 24 hours ago, a middle-aged man from suburban Pittsburgh, fueled by fear and lies about the Jewish people, walked into the Tree of Life synagogue shouting hateful words against the Jews and began shooting people at random. In the blink of an eye, people who were doing exactly what we are doing right now, worshiping and gathering in peace to praise our God, had their lives forever scarred and marred by this evil and hate-filled act. Eleven people lost their lives, and dozens were wounded. And that doesn't even take into account the hundreds and thousands that have been emotionally and spiritually scarred by this attack. And I was chilled when I read yesterday that this was the synagogue of the parents of some great friends of ours that befriended us when we first moved out to Pennsylvania. When Emily and I were in Pennsylvania, two of our greatest friends were Rabbi Anna and her husband Josh. This was her parents' synagogue. And thankfully, her parents are safe today. But a wonderful friend of theirs was killed. A person who had adopted their cat when they could no longer have them. Who was there to celebrate with them on their engagement and the day of their wedding, even signing their marriage certificate. Friends, on a day like today, we grieve with our Jewish brothers and sisters in Pittsburgh and around the world, and we pray for them and their families to be comforted. That's what we do as people of faith. But prayer is not enough in this time. I need to say that again as a pastor. Prayer is not enough in this time. We must act and break the silences as well. And our call to action today is to be the church. To be God's people that Christ calls us to be. We're called to listen to those who are normally ignored. We're to give voice to those who do not have one in our social and political systems. We are to stand up together in compassion and defiant love and say a definitive no to the hate and lies we hear being lifted up in our public discourse day after day. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Thank you. Friends, it seems nearly impossible to do this work alone. I believe it is impossible for us to do this work alone. But thankfully, we are not alone. God is with us. And God in Christ has given us the church so that we do not have to do this work alone. 
For together with the courage and strength God gives us, we can overcome hate with hope and build the world we truly want to live in, one that manifests and mirrors the kingdom of God. Will you pray with me? God, our refuge and strength, our ever-present help in troubled times. Speak unto our hearts this day that we might know how you are calling us to stand up and speak out for what silences you are asking us to break today. Give us the courage and strength to remain silent no longer and to make this world what you would have envisioned, what you have dreamed what you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to preach and to teach and to leave in our hearts a kingdom where all are united in love and in peace and in prosperity, where all have enough and none are terrorized and bullied. Let us live this with our lives this day, this week, and forever. In Jesus' holy name, amen.